distracted by the comments. I'm going to try not to look at them. <laughs> I was on one of these, and I kept on reading the comments. I was like, what does that mean? I know. <laughs> I've tried to disable that feature. I don't know how. <laughs> I've been on the other end of it. Well, now that uh, now that we're live and now that we're uh, gaining audience members, I want to welcome everyone to this episode of MPP TV, where we have a really fantastic guest. Uh, today, we've got anti-war icon uh, Cindy Sheehan, uh, with whom we are working uh, on the Women's March on the Pentagon this October from the 20th to the 21st. Uh, and so we hope all of you guys will be there. And Cindy, it's a great honor to have you uh, to have you with us. Oh, Nick, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be on and and to see your face. Yes, we spoke on the phone a couple times. Now I'm seeing your face. Yes, now we get to see each other, mm -hmm. uh, and I look forward to seeing you in person too. Yeah, I can't wait. It's <laughs> it's gonna be great. So I don't think that uh, that any conversation with you would be appropriate without first discussing how it is that you became this uh, incredible anti-war activist, the peace activist, um, and the story that that uh, begins, I know, with the Iraq war and with your son uh, who died abroad. And so mm -hmm. I, I hope you could tell all of our members uh, about that. Um, in 2004, my son Casey was deployed to Iraq. He was a member of the US Army. He was in the 1st Cavalry um, so they they were deployed a year after the initial invasion, and so we didn't agree with the war. He didn't agree with the war. He just said that it was his duty, and the the sooner he he went, the sooner he'd be home. Well, he was only there for a little over a week, and he was killed in combat, which he wasn't even supposed to go in combat. His uh, recruiter promised him that he would never see combat, but he was forced to go in combat. And so um, being against the war anyway, after he was killed, I just started to research and connect with people. And then um, in August of 2005, uh, I set up camp in Crawford, Texas called Camp Casey. And uh, well, we, that's what it was named by some Iraq vets against the war. And we had a month long peace camp in front of George Bush's uh, vacation home. Um, and uh, he said that our, that my son and everybody else died for a noble cause. So I wanted to ask him what was that noble cause. And I said I would stay there in Crawford camping by the side of the road until he met with me. Well, he never met with me, but thousands of people from all over the world came to join us in Crawford that summer. Um, and then after that, I just have been doing, so that was in 05. We had Iraq and Afghanistan and George Bush. Now it's 2018, Nick. <laughs> I'm, not telling, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know. But now that those two wars have expanded to seven or eight, and the U.S. has long been an empire with bases all over the world, wars going on. The uh, wars abroad are hitting us really hard here at home, whether people know that it's the effect of empire and that over a trillion dollars is spent every year on empire, this literally sucking our communities dry of resources and young people and besides that we're killing innocent people all over the world so um, that's how I started and I've never stopped because the wars have never stopped as a matter of fact like I just said they've expanded dramatically since my son was killed but certainly since 9-11 yeah and on top of that there's uh, your, your journey uh, mirrors so many of those of us who are with the Movement for a People's Party uh, and that we started off working with the Democrats. We started off thinking that uh, the Democratic Party, you know, was the antidote to the wars that the Bush administration had started. Um, I, uh, I I worked on um, on Obama's campaign, volunteered for him, and then I had, um, I had uh, staff positions uh, later on uh, with, uh, with McAuliffe and... Um, uh, uh, and John Kerry, 
And then of course I went to work for Bernie. And all of those experiences uh, showed me, I think very much like you learned, uh, and this is something that attracted us so much to the, the Women's March on the Pentagon, that the Democrats are just the other half of the war party, as you put it. Right. And so I, I, could you tell everybody uh, how it is that, that you came to discover that? Well, when I was in Crawford, Texas, there was quite a bit of um, interest. There was quite a bit of media attention, um, quite a bit of uh, anti-war fervor re reignited during that time. We had a march in D.C. Um, in September of 05, so shortly after Camp Casey closed, that had hundreds of thousands of people. And so the Democrats, I met with all of them. I met with Nancy Pelosi, I met with John Kerry, I met with Hillary Clinton, a lot of uh, reps and a lot of um, senators and almost to a person except for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary Clinton told me they had to continue the wars to honor the sacrifice of my son. So she sounded just like John McCain sounded when I met with him. And so all of these leading Democrats tell me, Cindy, if you help us take back the House in 2006, we'll help you end the wars. And so being very naive and trusting, I thought there, <laughs> I thought that there, I laugh at myself, um, but it, my, my, my energy came from a good place. <laughs> Their energy comes from a very bad place. I thought that they were telling the truth. So, um, I worked to help them get reelected, and they also gained majority in the House. Remember, Nancy Pelosi became Speaker of the House. The first thing they did was approve more war funding for the wars. And so that's when I started also protesting them. And protest almost died in Washington, D.C. after 2007. And so, but I still, I still kept it up. And, and I think it was... In May of 2007, they approved something else for the wars, whether it was the surge or more war funding or supplemental funding or whatever. I said, that's it, I'm done. I'm leaving the Democrat Party. And then um, I got all kinds of hatred <laughs> from people who had supported me up till then. But, uh, but then, you know, since then, I know who's really my friend. <laughs> you know, the people who are still my friends now, they were really my friends. But then in 08, Nancy Pelosi, you know, refused to put impeachment on the table. So then I ran against Nancy Pelosi as an independent. And that and my break with, with the Democrat Party, um, first I went to be no party preference in California. Now I'm with the Peace and Freedom Party um, here in California. I, I remember the way that um, uh, Obama... Uh, picked up, you know, uh, right after having won in 2008, he was campaigning not just on ending the wars, but he was campaigning on uh, potentially putting the Bush administration on trial. Uh, and it was amazing how quickly that ended. I mean, just the minute he, he won, you know, there was a complete turnaround on that. He picked up, obviously, Robert Gates, Bush's defense secretary, you know, uh, secretary of defense. He, continue, he, he picked up right where the Bush administration left off, Barack Obama, on the, uh, the surge in Afghanistan. Uh, and so, you know, it, he, even to a degree where he, he took it beyond the plans that had existed inside the Bush administration. So, you know, that really exposed, I think, uh, how the, the, the incredible continuity that there is, you know, between the two parties. Uh, and the sham that is the two parties. And of course, what we're doing is the movement for people's parties. We're saying, you know, like Peace and Freedom Party, uh, that we need a major new party, you know, and that now there is, uh, there, there are almost two thirds of the American people uh, recognize that. And so we've, we've come to exactly that same conclusion. So I want you to tell me, uh, it, I suggest everyone go and check out the Women's March on the Pentagon. Uh, the website for the event and the details. Uh, and also, uh, just because reading the website is inspiring. Uh, it's inspiring to see the recognition, Cindy, that went into the fact that uh, that we're being fooled, 
by the you know by this idea that there's any difference between these two parties. Uh, and so, Cindy, I think this is a perfect chance for you to tell us uh, tell us about the march. Tell us how it was born uh, and what you plan on doing next month. This is another thing. So, um, I told you I kept on being an anti-war, uh, pro-justice activist during the Obama administration, and I was very lonely. There wasn't very many. There wasn't very much energy around protesting Obama for anything. And so, um, when Trump was first inaugurated, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't a Trumper. I wasn't an Obama or who ran against him certainly not Hillary Clinton. So um, my sister uh, died from stage four breast cancer like the day after Trump was inaugurated. So I wasn't really even thinking that much about you know movements or what was going on. But I knew that there was a really large women's march. And you know, even my sister, when she's in hospice seeing those pussy, pink pussy hats, we were just laughing at them. But um, anyway, uh, so the next year, the um, Women's March was having their one year anniversary. And then now I was more aware of what was going on. So I looked at their website, nothing about war. And I reached out to them and I said, why isn't war a major women's issue? And they and one of them said to me, Cindy, we appreciate war is your issue, but it won't be our issue until women are free. And what they really meant was until Democrat women were free from Trump. That's that's their freedom. And so I think it's a very chauvinistic women's movement that doesn't recognize the impact of war on women, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And so um, that. That's when we kind of came up with the Women's March on the Pentagon, and we chose the Pentagon because we think that it is, you know, representative of the bipartisan war machine. Like you said, Obama um, appointed Gates or kept Gates as, as the Secretary of Defense when he when he took yeah. over office. Yeah, and so and and the expansion of the wars dramatically under a Democrat president. So uh, we could have gone to the White House, we could have gone to Congress, but really we think the Pentagon is ground zero for the war machine in the United States. So we chose the Pentagon and we chose October 21st because that's the 51st anniversary of the first major uh, demo at the Pentagon in 1967. And yeah, that's why we're doing it because we think we're in solidarity with women around the world um, who are being uh, occupied, who are, who, who are being made refugees, their communities are being destroyed, not just in the active war zones, but everywhere there's a U.S. base, there's a crime, there, there's, it's like a super fun site, there's pollution, there's all kinds of problems. So, um, and then here in the United States, we're in solidarity with women and, and, um, you know, inner cities who who are afraid to let their children walk just because that they might be slaughtered by a cop just for being black or brown. We're in solidarity with students who can't pay their student loans or can't go to go to college without getting student loans. We're in solidarity with, with homeless people and women. See, this is how war affects women. It makes families homeless. It makes women have to um, be very insecure, and so we we don't say um, the Pentagon is peace through strength. Uh, Dennis Kucinich says strength through peace. We say security through peace. That's what everybody wants. We want the security to be free from war and occupation, to be free from capitalism and imperialism, and all the very bad things that come with these institutions. Right. I mean, think of the uh, something that isn't considered enough, I think, is the opportunity cost of uh, all of these resources that we just drain, you know, on war in, a, in addition to uh, in addition to the active suffering that we're causing. You know, I mean, because of that, it would be better to I mean, to burn that money. But if you yeah. put it to a different use, uh, then you could have things uh, you could 
Uh, I've seen statistics, you know, you could have a free public college for everyone. You could uh, go a long way towards providing Medicare for all, you know, and of course the savings in Medicare for all would already be greater than the uh, horrific healthcare system we have already. You know, you could put uh, basically, um, you, you could make the transition to uh, clean renewable energy, which would uh, obviate the reason, you know, that uh, that so many people say, uh, and that the Bush administration, for example, claimed that we were in the Middle East, you know, for, for resources, you know, why would we need any, re- any, any oil uh, or hydrocarbon resources either to, whether it means going abroad, destroying countries abroad, invading countries, uh, instigating regime changes, or here at home, destroying uh, parks or, or offshore uh, refuge, uh, offshore areas as well, in going after that. So, I mean, there's this immense opportunity cost. And of course, lo and behold, you know, it's the Democrats again who are now opposing Trump from the right. And it's the Democrats. Right who are the ones who are like, they're giving him more money. You know, they say he's this, like he has authoritarian tendencies, you know, wants to establish a military dictatorship. And so their, and so their solution is let's give him more money for the military. What a great idea, more money than he even asks for. What Cindy, I think it's, we're up to like uh, almost, uh, I I know, I think it's about 56% of the discretionary budget now, right? That goes to war. Yeah. Practically 60% goes to war and empire maintenance. And, you know, we we at the Women's March on the Pentagon said that even if all these wars just cost $1, we'd still be against them. But what, oops, (laughs) it just hit my screen. One way we can reach people is, is like you just said, what good could we do in our communities, our homes, and um, our neighborhoods if we weren't sending all that money to Washington DC to pay to kill people. And so, um, that, you know, that's, that's a way that we can try and reach people here who aren't like my family and have really felt the true and tragic cost of war. They, we need, people need to realize that even if they don't know anybody who's serving or, or have had anybody killed like my family has, that it really is affecting their their own lives, this military industrial complex that we're protesting. And we call ourselves the nonpartisan march on the bipartisan war machine because uh, it's just, it doesn't matter. And do you remember when Trump, it was in May of 2017, Trump bombed an airfield in Syria, and then all the pundits started calling him presidential? We need to end that kind of attitude. You know, it's presidential, actually, I would think, to want to talk, and and Trump gets so much crap for talking to people like um, Kim Jong-un in Korea or Putin, but he gets all kinds of applause if he bombs people. We need to change that paradigm. We have to make it wrong. We have to make it disgusting. We have to make these people pariahs who feel like bombing is preferable to diplomacy. Yes, that was the most praise I've ever seen him get in the mainstream media. <laughs> I know it was crazy. Uh, and from yeah, yeah. You know, politicians and oh look, he now he's starting to act like a president. Well, you know what? They they right. thought that was fun. I thought it was pitiful. I thought it was pathetic to to say that a president of the United States, but it's true. It's absolutely true. We have to make that paradigm false that it's not presidential, that it's not something that, yeah. that, um, that you know, we think that presidents have to do. It, it's not, they're not protecting us. They're not protecting our communities. As a matter of fact, bringing all this hardware um, to police forces, militarizing police forces, spying on us here, killing U.S. citizens abroad without um, any kind of trials or transparency. You know, that stuff has to be made. It's not normal. It's got to be made not normal. We have to renormalize peace and prosperity for all and security for all without having this gross uh, Pentagon and gross Pentagon budget. You, you've brought together a really uh, amazing group of anti-war uh, activists to do this. Uh, and so I want you to share that with everyone. 
who is it that's working with you? Uh, and also, uh -huh. what do you want to accomplish uh, with the march, uh, with the march specifically? And you know, well, we what, actually have. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I, I didn't hear your last. What comes after? You know, what is the process like? What is the larger objective? I know we've talked about this a little bit. Yeah, so um, at our website, uh, marchonpentagon.com, we have a long list of endorsers. Um, we have been able to get, like, the usual suspects on board, Veterans for Peace, Code Pink, um, Answer, and, um, you know, those are the those are the organizations. But we have dozens and dozens and dozens. But what's really exciting is we've also got to uh, work with – MPP and a new group. So there's a feminist group in uh, Chicago that's super radical, and we're getting to learn about these people. Going and going forward, we're going. We want to work with people who are also anti-imperialists who recognize it that it is um, both parties. And after the march, the, we consider the march on the Pentagon the kickoff. And so the kickoff for this this female-led and driven um, anti-imperialist uh, proposition that's never been done in the United States before and so we want to go forward and work with other people who and, and be kind of like this uh, coalition of anti-imperialists to um, make these behaviors abnormal aberrant behaviors to be to you know, almost be like your mom or your grandma saying no 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 this this you guys are nuts this isn't happening anymore but you know to to use our power to use political power people power street power all working together to change this country and so we're excited to go forward with movement for people's party um you can't you can't separate politics from life. Politics means work of the people. And so, um, but we need a new way of doing politics in this country, not yeah. the old way of doing politics. It's not working for anybody. So th this is what we're trying to create something new along and as kind of like a coincidence or serendipity that you're cr trying to create this new political energy, a new way of doing politics we're trying to create a new way of doing activism and protests and actually to have an effect on policy and actually to tell people it's not okay to stop protesting when a Democrat's in the White House. <laughs> we have to keep on moving forward. War is bad no matter who's doing right. it. Right, exactly. It's about the policies. You know, it's about the actions, it's not about the, the, the letter next to their name. Um, so I wonder too, as uh, as someone who's been uh, a member uh, and a leader, uh, and someone who's been so affected by war yourself, and someone who's been thinking about this for so long, what kind of strategy do you think that the anti-war movement needs? You know, and what do you think are the most uh, the most valuable activities for people who are watching us and who say, "I wanna, I wanna read the anti-war movement." Uh, that's what. Called our, our our interview. I want to restart that. How, what kind of strategy do you think um, the anti-war movement needs? Well, I think the strategy that is most lacking in the anti-war movement that that it needs desperately is to be nonpartisan. Every election, you'll see some of these um, groups to say, oh, we have to like uh, support the Democrat because if we don't have the Democrat, the Republican is going to win and my answer has always been so what you know it, it if you're a peace group it doesn't it shouldn't matter to you <laughs> who's president of the united states because they're all violent they're all terrible and a lot of these organizations aren't independent from from money and funding you know i call it the peace industrial complex so they're not they're not uh independent from funding that is um you know, has a bias towards the Democrat Party. I think that um, the movement as a whole needs to make a break from the Democrat Party, a clean break, a complete break from the Democrat Party, because you can't be an effective activist against something if you're encouraging people to vote for that thing. 
you know, like the same thing with the institutional um, in, environmental party. They went to 360.org, went to front in front of the White House and said, no pipelines, but we're still going to vote for you. You know, and they had a Obama Biden pins on them. No, we, we can't do that. So, I mean, I think it would be great if we could focus on, um, you know, candidates and issues outside of the two party system, you know, uh, in uh, only in collaboration with the movements, only in collaboration with policy. Um, drive. So that's my first suggestion is make a complete break from the Democrat Party or we're never going to be successful. I couldn't we're agree never more. End wars. Huh? <laughs> I couldn't but, agree more with that. Yeah, we're never going to end wars if there's not a complete break with the Democrat Party. Yeah. Um, well, we're never going to end war if there isn't a party that supports that. You know, it's right. like, how are you going to end war without a political choice? It's a, I mean, it's the same thing down the line of issues. How are you going to stop climate change when there's no party that really, uh, you know, opposes reversing climate change? You know, there's one party that doesn't even acknowledge that it's true. And then there's another party that pays lip service to it. You know, how are you going to, uh, how are you going to end uh, these horrific financial crashes, which I believe were on the verge of another one 10 years after the last? You know, if you're doing that, if there's no party that is about regulating finance and there's no party that's about breaking up the big banks, you know, and these yeah, are things that the, the majority Democrat of Americans it's support. Not it's not the Democrat Party. It's not the Republican Party. They've yeah. shown over and over and over again, like you said, the Democrats will pay lip service to some things. But as with Wall Street and war, they're active participants. Right. They're active participants in screwing the people over. So, you know, we just need a multi-pronged attack and people like us who are on the same page, we need to share our, um, our energy, share our, um, you know, activities, work together for true change. So my view is uh, there's, there's uh, wars have traditionally been used to distract uh, from domestic conditions. Uh, and so my view is that the next time that we have a recession uh, in the US, uh, you know, which, which, as I said, I believe will be soon, uh, since we're now pushing up upon 10 year mark since the last uh, recession, which is uh, the record for you in US history. Uh, and so I think that it's very likely that Trump uh, pushed by the Democrats <laughs> and completely aided by the Democrats uh, will engage us in another war. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, whether it's uh, per perhaps in Venezuela, you have those amazing quotes that came out about how Donald Trump was saying, you know, he wanted to invade Venezuela. That seems almost like beginning to get that message out there. So I wonder, do you think that there's another war coming? How do you think it will happen uh, and and how can we build up this effective kind of opposition uh, to to prevent that uh, or to oppose it if it does? Well, I think that uh, obviously uh, we live in the United States of, Amer of America and there will be another war at some point. So uh, I know that uh, the U.S. And, and Israel and Saudi Arabia have really stepped up things in the Middle East, in Yemen, mm. in um, Syria in is in Palestine and so we we're going to um, not only be proactive but reactive so we we now have you you guys have we have huge networks of people that we can say you know this no you know let's hit the streets and I really think that um, protest has to be our protest has to be more um not so symbolic not like we're just going to the pentagon and then we're going to forget about it you know we have to be and, and people like me who you know have grandchildren and i really care about the people all over the world i'm a war tax resistor i don't own a car i've tried to do everything i can to live a lifestyle that is opposite to what the united states of america uh, promotes, but you know, to really start doing um, 
dedicated, courageous acts of civil resistance and, you know, just working together with other people who are willing to do um, things like that to affect real change. And, you know, I'm not sure that anything that that we can do can like stop any wars from happening because I really don't think right now they care about, about how we think, but that's because they know they got us. They know they got us tied up by propaganda. They know they got us tied up by partisan politics. And it's just amazing to me <laughs> what, what the Democrat partisans um, hate Trump for that they put up for with um, in Obama, for example, or, or Hillary Clinton, or and and they're turning into new the new red baiters, and they hate Russia and blah blah blah, whatever. So I think that you know, Nick, I just really think that's our basic problem. I think that if people are aware of politics, they think that they're being super radical if they're a Democrat, or they think they're being super patriotic if they're a Republican, and both of those parties are killing us, and they're killing the world. And that's just, uh, that's not being alarmist and I'm not exaggerating. So, you know, um, really basically what we have to do is uh, educate people about, about uh, making those breaks with those two parties and joining us in, um, in an uprising, uprisings in the street and uprisings uh, in the polls. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We participated um, in uh, the Youth Climate March uh, this July and also on the Poor People's Campaign in June. Uh, and I saw the power of civil disobedience. Uh, we all did. Many of our members across the country participated in the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, and so I think it's absolutely something we need to participate more in. Uh, you know, we need to uh, be willing to put our, our bodies against the gears of the machine, you know, as it has become so odious uh now well, and that speech was first given in 1964 and things have not gotten better than when mario savio took to the steps in berkeley sprout hall i think it was and gave that speech things have gotten far worse since then and um you know just and, and we have to recognize that that as we sit here and do nothing it's not it's not just a matter of like these poor hillary clinton women who couldn't go to brunch the day of the women's march did you see those signs if yeah. if she had, if hillary had one we'd be at brunch it's not about that it's about people being killed people being uh displaced people being their countries being ruined so joining together to show those people that not all Americans are selfish brunch eaters. You know, we are, there are some of us who want that kind of behavior to stop. Yeah. Cindy, there's something I, 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 that just came to me now. Uh, do you know how, so Obama replaced the torture pro because he was so progressive. Obama replaced Bush's torture program with a drone program, you know, really uh, ramped up the drone program. So whereas Bush, you know, would interrogate people, uh, torture people, uh, Bush would just, I mean, Obama would just murder them uh, with Trump. Right. And so I wonder right. what has uh, become of that uh, balance during the Trump administration? Do you know what, what he's, uh, what is he, what is he striking there? Um, I don't know. I don't know if he's, if he's continued Obama's what we call terror, or I think he might have called them terror Tuesdays, when they decided who were who was going to be murdered by drone, and when they murdered um, Anwar al alaki his 16-year-old son Abdul Rahman al alaki and Abdul Rahman's friend Samir Khan, American citizens without yes. their due process, and those was like those were when you drop a drone on somebody, you're not just killing that person, you're killing hundreds of people other people in the area. So, um, hello. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know if Obama has, I mean, I, I know that Trump is increasing the bomb output over Obama. And Obama was a really good bomber. 
But from what I understand, Trump is um, outstripping um, Obama's bombing. Um, but I also read that the bomb manufacturers are being concerned because they're running out of materials, which I think would be a great thing if that were true. But um, no, the, the empire is, Trump is a really good distraction from, um, for the yeah. Pentagon. You know, he's running interference for the Pentagon and for the war machine. And none of these things have, even though he does talk to Putin or does talk to, um, you know, other leaders that the de makes the Democrats really mad, <laughs> he talks to them. The empire is still, unfortunately, rolling on with all the wars that Obama created and escalating in Syria, like I said. And God forbid, you know, that the U.S. actually uh, attack Venezuela. You know, it, of course, it would be just another unprovoked attack. But um, it's just we just <laughs> we just live in a freak show, and it's up to us to reverse that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. That's why we're so glad to be supporting you and to be working with you. Uh, so we'll be outside the Pentagon on the 20th and the 21st. The Movement for and People's Party will be there. And, you, and uh, you'll be speaking at our rally, right? I will. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Very, very, it's going to be great. Yeah. I think we're going to, we're getting um, a lot of great musical acts that are going to entertain us and a lot of wonderful speakers. We might even be getting our permit soon from the Pentagon, which has been really a struggle to to um, do that. But it looks like they're going to accommodate us, like they accommodate all the uh, pro-war rallies that they have there. But it's going to be a very exciting day, and it's just really exciting how excited people are about it, but how also we're excited to move forward with our new anti-imperialist movement. Yeah. Well, so are we. So, Cindy, it's been great to talk to you. Uh, the, please tell everyone where they can go uh, to find you and to find all of the information. Well, uh, it's marchonpentagon.com is our website. Our Facebook is Women's March on the Pentagon 2018. I also have a podcast, Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. You just Google Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. And I have 10 years of great archi archival guests. And um, uh, it's also a clearinghouse for activism. So I hope to have you on my show soon. I would love to. <laughs> would love to you. Cindy, thanks so much for joining us. We'll be out there in force uh, on, on the Pentagon. Uh, and it's, uh, it's great to talk to you. And look forward to seeing so many of you guys uh, with MPP there as well and supporting. Well, keep up the good work, Nick. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.